it all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. Our guest today is CEO Richard Ritt Carano. Ritt is Chief Executive Officer of Purchasing Power, a company he is guided to achieve consistent annual double-digit revenue growth, 95% client retention, and more than $2.5 billion in processed orders. Ritt received his Bachelor of Science in Business Administration with an emphasis in accounting from the University of Richmond's Robbins School of Business and also earned an MBA in finance from Emory University. Ritt Carano, welcome into the corner office. Thank you for having me. Oh, that's terrific. Well, listen, we always like to start with the early years, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about growing up and what your family life is like. Are you uh, an Atlanta native? Uh, I am not. I actually uh, was born in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, and then probably like far too many kids in our society, my parents divorced when I was quite young, actually six years old. And uh, my father stayed in Wilmington. My mother and the kids moved to Storrs, Connecticut, which is S-T-O-R-R-S. Everyone always gets that wrong, uh, which is actually home of the University of Connecticut, UConn. Yeah, know it well. I'm actually uh, recording today from Litchfield, Connecticut, which is about an hour and a half down the road. So did you spend most of your years growing up in Connecticut then? Uh, definitely the formidable years. Uh, you know, most of my elementary school and high school years were in Connecticut. Brothers and sisters? I do have one sister, a couple years older than I am, and she actually is living here in uh, in Atlanta as well. So uh, parents divorced, and it sounds like you kind of stayed with your mom. And in those days, boy, that's a pretty big distance. Did you spend some summers with dad? Did he have much of an influence on your life as you were growing up? Uh, he did, yeah. You know, thankfully, he uh, he always took the time to visit. You know, unlike today where, you know, parents who divorce live like down the street from each other. Right. You know, he um, he actually relocated to Ohio. Uh, we were still in Connecticut, but, you know, visited at least quarterly and then spent most of the summer with them uh, and also, you know, holidays, things like that. So, you know, he was around a good bit, um, but certainly not like today where, you know, I was commuting from one house to the next every other day. Right, right. And parents, both um, uh, professionals, did they have their college degrees? Tell us a little bit about them. Uh, they did. Yeah. My father uh, was actually a PhD in pharmacology. Uh, so he was, uh, you know, a scientist uh, primarily studying, you know, in the earlier days, cancer research, and then in the later days, actually AIDS research. Uh, but he was always in the industry, uh, you know, as an executive in a pharmaceutical business. Uh, my mother, you know, also a college grad, um, you know, the earliest part of her career she, she spent in uh, the legal profession, mostly, you know, paralegal kind of legal secretary. Uh, she probably was more of the entrepreneurial spirit uh, that I kind of turned into. She uh, started her own business, was a, you know, owned an, uh, her own travel agency and, um, you know, certainly figured out a way to, to get to make ends meet. Did she remarry uh, after moving up to Connecticut? Uh, she did. Actually, both my parents remarried, uh, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, very soon after being divorced, but soon enough, you know, I think both of them have been now remarried probably 30 plus years. So you had the benefit of four parents, which I like to tell uh, my kids as well. Um, what, you know, kind of influence, if any, did those step parents have on your uh, early days? Uh, you know, there was definitely an influence of my way isn't the right way. Uh, you know, my, <laughs> you know, my parents, perhaps out of, you know, that guilty conscience of being a divorced parent would more often than not, you know, give you everything you wanted or, 
you know, tell you everything was okay. Uh, you know, the step parents definitely were the ones who intervened with bringing some reality to some, <laughs> right, you know, th- to right. that stuff that, you know, Hey, guess what? You're not the, the king of the land here. And, <laughs> you know, you don't get everything you want. So they, they brought a, a dose of reality. Any other influencers early in your life? Uh, any special teachers or you know coaches that uh, had an influence on your development in those early kind of elementary school days? Uh, well, absolutely. You know, I am a definite jock. You know, played sports uh, really throughout my entire life and through college. Uh, you know, one of the the bigger influences was my high school soccer coach, a gentleman named John Blomstrand. And I actually think he is the winningest soccer coach in the state of Connecticut, still <laughs> still coaching, you know, and that's been probably 30 years uh, since I played for him. Um, but he was probably the first person who I would say instilled a sense of belief in me when, uh, you know, we were trying out for uh, the, the varsity soccer team and I was a, a sophomore. And I remember very distinctly, you know, I was kind of doing a lot of the warm up drills and things like that with other friends of mine. Uh, and he came over to me and he said, uh, you know, what, why do you keep doing all your drills with, with these guys here? And I was like, oh, well, they're my friends. He's like, well, they're still going to be your friends. But if you want to make this team, you better start playing with people who are your equal of talent. Uh-huh. And, and so, um, you know, definitely was a, a very early lesson learned on, you know, your friends are your friends. And the people you want to maybe have success with or achieve things with might not be the same set of people. If you need to stretch yourself, yeah, exactly. people are at the same level or perhaps higher. Yeah, good lesson. Yeah, so so by no means, you know, weigh yourself down because you you know you've got some kind of loyalty toward toward a friend. You know, set, set your sights, and if you got to go out and do it with some other people, that's what you got to do. Were you a good student, Rit? Uh, I was. Uh, you know, your prototypical kind of straight A student. Um, you know, I, I I wouldn't ever say that school was super easy. But it, it wasn't it wasn't super difficult either, you know. Public school, private school in Connecticut, or what did you? Uh... Yeah, I was I was a public school kid. Um, you know, I ended up going to a private college, university, um, and so. But the interesting thing about my high school was that it was actually owned by the University of Connecticut. So as I mentioned, grew up in Stores, Connecticut, which is home to UConn. You know, virtually every one of my friends' parents were professors at the university. And I think at some point in the evolution of the school, um, those parents were recognizing the quality of the, the the local public high school education wasn't strong enough. And so I think they, they, they coerced the University of Connecticut to somehow intervene and kind of take over the administration of the school, which obviously then led to a really strong curriculum. Huh. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Well, you mentioned soccer. And of course, UConn's known for its basketball. Was that also a sport that you pursued? Um, you know, I did. I was a three sport letterman in high school. I did play uh, basketball and golf in addition to soccer, but probably uh, unbeknownst to many folks, uh, the men's soccer team at UConn, certainly in my era and even now today, was a very prolific success. Um, and they actually were a national champion back in the early 80s, which again was mostly in my you know adolescence there. Um, and they had a, a very consistent uh, program that you know, probably was the leading sports attraction in Connecticut at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And obviously that kind of filtered down to the element the, the high school that UConn uh, sponsored, it sounds like to some yeah, degree. Yeah. You know, the head coach of the, the men's soccer team there, his sons were, you know, um, went to my high school. So again, there was a, a definite legacy already at the high school level of, of moving into that college level player. What about other uh, things outside class, uh, music, theater, drama, you know, anything else that you were involved with uh, during the middle school and high school years? Yeah, I definitely was involved in a lot of things. You know, I wouldn't put any of them as passions. Um, You know, I uh, volunteered for a number of different organizations like Safe Rides was was a very new concept back in that era, you know, where where your friends would be out and about and, you know, you'd man a phone line. And if anybody needed a, a, a ride somewhere, you know, this is pre Uber, right? Right. They'd right. call you up and you'd go and you'd pick them up and drive them around town. Um, and so uh, that was a, a very interesting thing because again, you know, it was not just, you know, hey, you're doing good, but you're actually helping to hopefully, you know, I don't want to call it save lives. I mean, that might be a little overly dramatic, but, um, you know, you were given back. And so, uh, so that was a, that was a keen interest. You know, I was a member of the ski club, you know, we would, uh, take a trip or two a year and go skiing. Um, 
we had an explorers club as well, which was similar. You'd take a trip or two to go camping and hiking and you know, definitely an outdoorsy, uh, active guy. Yeah. Yeah. Any student government where it was politics, a part of your uh, repertoire at all? Uh, yeah. So interestingly, I was my freshman class treasurer. Okay. All right. Um, and so going back to my mother who you, uh, had asked about a second ago, she, um, probably the most time she put into anything she ever did was, uh, in the political environment. She, she ran for office for state representative. She was the head of virtually every Republican committee of the, you know, the town we lived in and ran number campaigns. And quite frankly, I think my overexposure to that has it turned me off mightily. So, so while, <laughs> while I was the freshman uh, treasurer, I uh, gave up politics thereafter. It was a precursor of your CFO responsibilities that come more than anything else. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Tell us about any entrepreneurial things you were involved with, uh, you know, paper routes as a kid, selling stuff at Christmas time. Was that, you know, part of what you did for spending money or not so much? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and this is this is actually when I tell these stories, most people kind of look at me cross-eyed, you know, like, come on, this this can't be true. But um, you know, I, I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, I was fortunate enough that you know my my father, um, you know, was uh, in industry, uh, you know, an executive in a pharmaceutical company, and so every Christmas I'd get probably some of the cooler electronics, you know, uh, all the handheld game systems before you know, they have the, you know, the Xbox stuff today, but back then it was all handheld, like one, one game for basketball, one for football, one for baseball. Uh, and so I'd always get one of those and I'd come back and then I would rent it out to my <laughs> friends at recess. It. <laughs> yeah. It was a novelty, right? No it one else it had was. It. Yeah. Nobody had them. So, and so I would rent those out. Uh, and that was probably back starting in maybe the fourth grade, you know, and, and every year, every year I'd upgrade and, you know, they'd be psyched to, to, to put their hands on the newest stuff. <laughs> like so much an hour or a minute or how would you uh, structure your pricing? Yeah, no, it, it was 25 <laughs> cents, 25 cents for the entire recess. So, it, so it was affordable. It was affordable. Sure. sure. Um, you know, as I, as I began to drive, uh, you know, again, I was equally fairly fortunate to, to have a car, uh, back then when I first got my license and, um, Again, we already had an Uber reference, but a second Uber reference was um, I would drive. I would It was a dollar a ride. Like I'd pick up my friends as I drive to school every morning. I'd pick them, a handful of them up along the way and, you know, it was a dollar a day and that was the deal. And so were you, you one know, of the first to have their driver's license or, or first to have access to a car? Perhaps? You know, it was probably first to have access to the car. I, <laughs> right, right. I had a, a later birthday than than most, but um, but but first to have a car. And and that was probably that was probably because you know my my mother was working full time, and I needed a way to get back and forth to school or after practice or what have you, and so it was kind of a necessity that I had transportation. Right. So did you have a an old jalopy or oh yeah, as my thing. wife would call a train station car or something like that? <laughs> it's uh, I tell you what, it was a disaster. I mean, it was <laughs> the worst looking car you ever saw, but it got the job done. That's great. That's great. And in high school, and then we'll get into your college years in a moment, any other jobs? Did you, you know, flip burgers or work retail or anything like that? Or was it more entrepreneurial to get your spending money? Yeah, no, I did have a, a, a real legitimate job. Um, I was probably making $2.30 an hour uh, as a stock clerk at a, at a Cumberland Farms a uh, convenience store. Oh, sure. Right. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was stocking shells and loading the freezer up, um, during the summers. Uh, that was, that wasn't very fun, but you know, it's a, it's a real lesson in, in hard work, right? You, you just gotta, gotta grind through it and just do it. So pretty much a foregone conclusion. You'd go to college. It sounds like you're a good student. Both mom and dad had their degrees. How did you go about picking the college you'd go to and the major that you decided to study? So, you know, education was always first and foremost, but as an athlete, um, I definitely put a premium on uh, trying to find a school where I could also play on the soccer team. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I was part of what was a very new, I guess, concept back then, which is called the Olympic Development Program, ODP. And it, and it was um, an outcropping of, of the U.S. soccer program where they were trying to, you know, create visibility into... Uh, uh, the, the entirety of the country to find players for, you know, for the next level. And anyway, through that program, um, we had some great exposure to play other players, uh, tournaments, what have you. 
and a lot of coaches would would go to those tournaments and and recruit. And so um, I came to know the University of Richmond. Uh, the couple other schools that I looked at, um, you know, while I liked the schools a lot, you know, UVA was one of those. William and Mary was another one of those. Um, it was pretty obvious to me that I would never play on the soccer team there. You know, they just uh, had a, a a stronger history of being competitive. Um, and, you know, recruiting all Americans, which I were they wasn't. division, were they division one schools? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All division one and, and Richmond is division one as well. Um, and so anyway, it became clear that, uh, you know, Richmond f- had the academic, uh, quality that I wanted and, um, I would equally be able to play on the men's soccer team there. Awesome. So you recruited there. Was there a scholarship involved as well? Uh, there was not, no, no. Um, choice to go and then, and, and play. And, and did you start? in your first year? Or? You know, so, um, I started maybe the last couple of games. I think the, uh, you know, the, the coach there, um, had a, a very different coaching philosophy than my high school coach and my high school coach I mentioned earlier. He, um, he was very much a, I'm in it with you kind of guy, right? If we, he'd send us on a five mile run, he'd be running right there with us. Uh, the college coach and I, you know, it was, a, it was an eye opener for me. You know, that was a business, right? His entire livelihood was tied to that. And, you know, it was a little bit more of the command and control environment. Um, and so, um, you know, th- the notion of playing there was different. And so when people would fall in and out of favor, you know, the, the immediate reaction was you're benched, right? It wasn't like, uh, I'm going to try to work through this or support you as a, a much more cut and dry thing. And so, you know, my freshman year, uh, I can't say that I wasn't any better than any other player that was getting, you know, starting time. But that being said, you know, a couple of those guys fell out of favor and all of a sudden you have your opportunity and yeah. And so I, uh, I, I started the last couple of games of the season and then that, you know, pretty much rolled into being a starter, you know, the remainder of my career there, you know, sophomore, junior, senior year. Sounds like you kind of one of the first introductions you had to cultural differences in organizations, right? It sounds like your high school coach had a very different philosophy, one that was much more perhaps a meritocracy, more supportive, whereas this one sounds a lot more autocratic. Would that be a fair comparison? No, absolutely. Um, and and the thing that, quite frankly, is it's kind of helped influence my leadership style. Um, neither one of them was less effective than the other, right? So uh, the high school team had a tremendous amount of success. Um, I would say the college team, maybe not quite as much success, but had, uh, you know, great success. You know, those, those UVA teams like that, we ended up beating, uh, you know, we played them in the NCAA tournament, um, you know, and so in that regard, we did have a lot of success, but it was absolutely an us versus them, you know, and I think that was the intention of the coach was create unity amongst the players by creating that conflict with the coaching staff. Interesting. Um, and again, it, I can tell you, uh, you know, one of my most memorable moments um, in, in playing for for Richmond was we had actually just lost to UVA and we're going through game film and the coach is rewinding a clip of me, um, what he called giving up on a play. And, you know, I, I still view it as a, another teammate of mine and I switched players and he didn't run with the guy. And so anyway, he, he rewound this thing in the team meeting for, I'd call it like 10 minutes. I mean, 50 times <laughs> oh, and, uh, and, and, and really, it in. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and absolutely kind of, it, yeah. Um, etched that, that memory in my head of, you know, what it means to be challenged, to not look like you are, uh, mailing it in, right. Not giving your wholeheartedness. So, so in that regard, uh, you know, certainly taught me a lot of life lessons about, you know what, I'm never going to put myself in a position again where somebody else is going to judge whether I was putting in the right effort or not. <laughs> good, good learning. Did you uh, uh, declare a business major pretty much straight out of the box? Did you know that's what you wanted to study? Uh, I did, yeah. When I, I took uh, an accounting course back in, in my high school days that I fell in love with, and there was just something that, I, you know, while, again, it's not a terribly sexy uh, industry, there was a an equilibrium in the way, you know, the numbers worked and, you know, everything has to balance that, that I, uh, that I liked a lot. Um, and so, uh, knew going into college that I was going to pursue business and specifically accounting, you know, I did graduate with an accounting degree and then, uh, got my CPA thereafter, uh, joined Deloitte and Touche, you know, in their audit practice, uh, spent five years with them, uh, and absolutely, uh, created a, a tremendous foundation around, I think, business acumen, 
and you know the way that I've always well, thought it started of it, in the fourth grade. Let's face it, yeah. right? With the rental of the game Game Boys or whatever they were. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but that was the um, you know that was the thing was I always believed that business was a game. Yeah. Right. It was score and, and scorekeeping. Yeah, scorecards. Yeah. Scorekeeping, mm-hmm. which was what the accounting function did. Uh, you know, was kind of the key to that. If you don't know how your activities are going to be kept on the scoreboard, you know, how do you know you're ever making the right decisions? And so that kind of foundation um, I thought was critical and absolutely followed that path, you know, for the early part of the career. And then, you know, went back to get the MBA to bring a little bit more of the decision making. So, right, we had the accounting scorekeeping and I wanted to move into the financial decision making, which was the MBA. So Deloitte, uh, five years uh, in the audit team, uh, straight out of college. Did you get into management responsibilities there, or were you uh, only working as an auditor, as an individual contributor during that period with Deloitte? No, the 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 model within public accounting is, I think, probably one of the best in the world in creating uh, leadership opportunities. So after your first two years, uh, you actually become what is called a senior accountant. And, and what that senior does is manages the staff on oh, a wow. given job, yeah. right? And so we would be, we'd be at an, a client for usually about a month at a time. Um, and after your first two years, you were then the day-to-day supervisor for everybody else. Um, and on top of that, you're also the person who on a daily basis is interacting with the client, you know, and that could be the client C- CFO, maybe their CEO, um, you know, their senior level executives, you know, you then after senior become a manager. Um, I had left Deloitte just after being promoted to manager. However, you know, for three years I had, I, you know, been a de facto manager on site, you know, managing day-to-day activity. So again, from the standpoint of, having that level of responsibility, decision-making, you know, executive presence, uh, all those things start very early. Yeah, early on. So you're you're, you're probably about 23, 24 years old. What what were some of the leadership lessons you picked up during that period? Uh, Well, the greatest lesson was actually spoken to me by my uncle who said, don't cook the books. (laughs) Good advice. (laughs) And and exactly. And, you know, while that is maybe a a more of a, a kitschy term, it's definitely one that is all about ethics and, um, you know, we've, we've all been exposed to any number of accounting scandals over the years, you know, and, and so being in public accounting, right, we're essentially attesting to the validity of, of these clients. And I can tell you without a doubt that in my experience there, I, I faced, you know, a handful of situations where it was obvious that a client was trying to do something that wasn't right. And so again, as a fairly young individual, having to confront that situation, having to, you know, assess the uh, the merits of the ethics, and you know, put forth a recommendation to how to address it was again an equally uh, huge lesson to learn at that early age. And by all means, you know, has has guided the way, you know, I think about uh, purchasing power and you know any of the leadership responsibilities that I have. Yeah, so true. And uh, straight into MBA school then out of Detroit, or was there a couple other jobs before you went on for your finishing degree? No. So so right after Deloitte was straight into uh, to the business school, uh, Guzueta Business School at, at Emory. Yep. And was that a choice to kind of, uh, you know, pivot in your career? Was it really something that you kind of decided, you know, you needed in order to get, as you said earlier, kind of that operational uh, experience to add on to your finance and accounting background? What, what were some of the, you know, the, the reasons behind pursuing your MBA at that, at that stage in your career? It was absolutely about a, a creating a pivot. Um, you know, like I had said, the, the scorekeeping foundational elements of accounting, I, I always believe were... Um, very important. But the notion of how do you, you know, analyze a problem, how do you uh, research, um, evaluate was was a gap in my career. And so, you know, the MBA was the opportunity to do that. And, you know, probably like most MBA programs now, everything is case study. So, you know, you're getting kind of real situations and you're having to, to, cr- to craft a, an approach of, you know, how do you deconstruct it? How do you come back then with the elements to um, inform your decision and then you make a recommendation. Um, and so, and so, so the MBA was, was the, you know, the first step in, in developing that side of my uh, experience. 
Now, I know you've done a lot of entrepreneurial things, including purchasing power, where you were, if not a founder, it sounds like obviously very early stages and, and days there. But what was that first job out of uh, MBA school? And tell us a little bit about your thinking behind going into that. Was it? Did you go straight into entrepreneurial things, or did you do corporate work prior to that? So it's a combination, actually. Um, during my uh, you know, the summer between my first and second year of business school, uh, I took a position with Smith Klein Beecham, you know, which is a multinational pharmaceutical uh, now Glaxo Smith Klein, um, and I was um, you know one of their summer interns, given uh, you know a project to work on during the course of the summer. Um, simultaneously, uh, a classmate of mine had was interning in uh, Silicon Valley for an internet startup. Uh, he had reached out to me at that time with, hey, I've got a great idea on my own. Uh, are you interested? And so I sure, surely was. And, you know, we got back for our second year of grad school and actually, you know, probably spent half of our time working on that business. Uh, that business was a, a, a company called eTor, which was a search kind of surf technology for the web. Um, but that being said, you know, we graduated uh, with our MBAs and you know, that hadn't been funded yet. So I took a position with Smith Klein Beecham full time in Philadelphia. Um, that was in their management development program, you know, which was a rotational program. You know, you'd spend, you know, nine to 12 months in a different part of the business and then you'd rotate onto something else. And, you know, at the end of it, you come out as a, a fairly knowledgeable, seasoned veteran um, uh, for, a, for a really significant leadership opportunity. Um, so while I was in the midst of that development program, uh, you know, the rotational program, uh, the ETOR uh, got a, a term sheet to be funded. And, and so I was put in this position of, yeah, do you stick with, um, you know, the management development program at Smith Klein Beecham, which was a great company, great company culture. I love the industry. I mentioned before my dad was As a PhD. I knew a little bit about it from your dad, right? Yeah, and- exactly. Was always fascinated with pharmaceuticals and, um, you know, uh, or, you know, leave all that behind and uh, start on this bit much bigger entrepreneurial opportunity. Um, the, the ceiling grace probably was, you know, we had just relocated to Philly, you know, I'd just gotten married and I think my wife kind of looked at me like, we're not going to be together any longer if, <laughs> no, if we stay in Philly, she was, she was, she was ready to go. <laughs> and so, uh, she, uh, you know, bless her heart. She was commuting to DC, you know, which is, uh, where I was with Deloitte and she'd been commuting to DC, you know, three days a week. And she was kind of like, I can't do this anymore. And so thankfully I think that was the. I guess that means Philly isn't in the, the equation long term. And so, that, you know, we, we, we moved down here to Atlanta and, you know, started to get after um, the e-tour business. Yeah. Awesome. Great. And no looking back. So uh, before we kind of talk a little bit about some of the developments on the entrepreneurial side, to tell, share us a little bit some of the, some of the best and the worst uh, lessons you've learned from bosses you've had over the years. Hmm. Well, I tell you what, that one is a, uh, a tough one. Um, if you prefer to focus on one or the other, that's okay. Because <laughs> sometimes it's easy to forget the ones that perhaps were scarring. <laughs> so I'll share, I'll, I'll just kind of speak to these kind of anecdotally as they come to mind. Uh, you know, I had a partner back in Deloitte days um, and he, uh, you know, the public accounting, especially in, in the tax season, you know, first quarter, you know, you're cranking the hours, you know, it's 60 to 80 hours a week. And, you know, you'd have any number of folks that would be complaining about that. And this one partner, um, you know, he was definitely a, a salty dog. Um, he would say, well, we can always figure out a way for you to not be busy at all, if you like. <laughs> and so that always kind of impressed upon me the notion of, you know what, hard work is just part of the equation. Don't complain about it. You know, being not being busy is actually probably a worst case scenario. So, so when you're busy, you know, look at that as, uh, you know, a great thing, because again, not being busy is probably a really bad thing. Um, so that, that was one of, uh, you know, one of those great stories, lessons learned. Um, you know, there's another one that I learned from the, uh, the ETOR day, and it was really about resource allocation, you know, kind of how do you manage your, your, your funds, um, especially in a startup environment. And, and this one, you know, this was back in the late nineties, you know, all of the major, um, kind of tech firms really weren't major at that time. You know, even, even your, um, your hardware guys, you know, and you know, your Sun microsystems, your Oracle, 
you know, all those guys exactly were still barely scratching the surface. And so, you know, each quarter end, they would have a, a tremendous promo on server space or, you know, hardware or something like that. And, you know, we would often fall into the trap of overbuying for things that we didn't need yet. Right. And so I, I coined a term way back then, which was, you know, I rather pay a premium for a sure thing than get a discount on wishful thinking. <laughs> and, and in that regard, you know, we, we bought, you know, because the deals were so great, you know, you ended up buying server space for your web traffic that you'd grow into over three years. Well, you know, that company, you know, flamed out before that. And all, and all you did was spend a lot of money on, you know, hardware and things like that, that you'd ever used. And, and so that was, uh, you know, again, a very uh, grand lesson to learn in that age and, you know, absolutely has influenced the way, you know, I've thought about resource allocation here at Purchasing Power. Well, you've had a very interesting career in that you've had, you know, two really terrific companies, large corporations, Deloitte, and then, of course, Smith, Klein, Beecham as kind of foundational early part of your years uh, in, in work and, you know, getting some, I'm sure, some very, very good principles there as well as some great anecdotes. And then, you know, the back half and the most recent part of your career, uh, very much entrepreneurial, startup success, and I'm sure some disappointments along the way. H how would you say your leadership style has kind of evolved over that period of time, um, making that transition, which, again, so much, so many of our audience look at as well. You know, I either want to go to a middle market company or I want to do something entrepreneurial. But, you know, I've got this strong base. I've got these great companies I've worked with in the past. Tell us a little bit about that. My management style has definitely evolved over the years. Um, it'd be very curious to ask that same question of some of the veterans that we do have here at Purchasing Power. You know, when I came in as a CFO, um, I was probably much more fixated on, you know, resource management um, and, and meaning, you know, holding people accountable to budget and deliverables. And, you know, I'd call that almost probably that leads you down more of a micromanagement point of view, you know, looking over their shoulder, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and and quite frankly, uh, probably missing a good bit of the big picture. Um, you know, as my responsibilities here have grown, and I certainly have become much more empathetic to the folks running the functional parts of the business, um, I've begun to recognize, you know, the trade-offs uh, that, that it really takes to make the right decision. You know, not everything is resource um, allocation. You know, uh, some of it is, yeah, opportunity only strikes, you know, once or twice and you need to be prepared and flexible to, 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 to take advantage of it. And so again, you know, the notion of maintaining flexibility and not being, you know, um, completely unraveled if, you know, you miss a, you know, a budget because of something that you felt was more important in the long term. So making those investments. And um, so, you know, without a doubt, uh, my style has changed a good bit. My overarching style is we talked about the soccer coaches in the, you know, in my past is much more of a, I rather be in it with you than just merely barking at you from the sideline. <laughs> more high school than college. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and equally it is one of a call earned autonomy you know, when we first bring you in, we've got very, very high expectations and, you know, but they're completely unproven. And so, you know, it does uh, require you to perform a few cycles of delivering, you know, successes. And then after that, you know, it's, you know, wide open, you know, uh, happy, happy for you to take the lead and, you know, just bring me along for the ride. Rit, we know um, in our executive search work how important it is to really understand a company culture. You know, and of course, every job's got its qualifications, and we do a big debriefing as it works and as it relates around to defining the job. But, you know, getting kind of a grasp of that company culture is so important and so unique because um, not everyone's going to, you know, necessarily work out. You know, qualifications on paper don't necessarily mean success within an organization. What are your thoughts on on building a company culture? You know, you were there, obviously, at the very early days. You've risen now to the corner office. Tell us a little bit about kind of your approach to that and your thoughts around the importance of company culture. Uh, without a doubt, it is probably the most important thing that any company uh, can get right. Um, I spend a tremendous amount of my time thinking of culture and or doing activities that help to promote it. Um, the So a, a very interesting evolution for us, um, back in 2011, uh, we went through a, a, an acquisition transaction where uh, a private equity firm called Rockbridge Growth Equity bought the business. 
And, um, and that was uh, a, a private equity group that was founded by Dan Gilbert. Uh, Dan being the founder of Quicken Loans, uh, owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, and during the course of that, that transaction, you know, they shared a lot of, and I called it back then, propaganda about what a great work environment they have there, you know, always on the best places to work list. And, you know, I was quite skeptical um, hearing all of that. And, you know, uh, during the course of that conversation, you know, I, I did visit them in Detroit. I, you know, went through their campus and, you know, the culture was absolutely palpable. I mean, you could touch it, you could feel it. And, you know, I came back from that visit, you know, straight into, uh, you know, our VP of HR's office with, my goodness, we don't have it right at all. You know, we have got so much to do to change the culture of, of the business. Um, and so um, from that point on, we actually did a good bit of research uh, to figure out, you know, really what is culture and how do you establish it? Um, you know, interestingly, we do spend a good bit of time onboarding new folks. Um, and in that conversation, you know, we, we kind of orient them to a lot of the things that are important to us. So it's not just our purpose statement, which is powering people to a better life, but there's also what we call superpowers. You know, those are your vision, you know, your, your values, concepts, um, but they're unique to us. Now, one of the questions I get from that group of new hires every time is, you know, hey, which, which, which of those values is most important to you? Um, and, you know, the answer is always, you know, none. They're all collectively, right? It's a collective body. Right, failing at, at, at one or two is is as bad as failing at all of them. Um, but then they ask, you know, well, how do you, you know, how do you set the culture? And my response is, you know what? Look, it's not my job to set the culture; it's your job to set the culture. You know, and so so I always push it back to them, which is, you know, hey, look, while this is kind of guidelines, if you guys don't care about these things or you don't believe that the the purpose statement is meaningful enough. You know, you're the ones that take accountability for enforcing it. If you could, if, you know, not that that's the right way to think about it, but of 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 holding other people accountable to it. It's not my job, right? I'm not the culture police, right? I don't walk around the office saying you you're adhering, you're not. Um, it's it's for the people. And at the end of the day, you know, the things that are important to us, the way we align with our customers um, to to execute their purpose, is really all about them. And so again, while I merely um, might be a mouthpiece to it, you know, the true connection to it, the you know, the engagement to it is is really through our people. So you see, company culture is really a dynamic force, right? I mean, it does change over time. Oh, it is a gr- a living, growing, breathing entity. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about um, you know the people you invest in. What, what do you look for when you're making bets on them? The people you're going to hire. Uh, well, so. There's a, a concept. So um, I'll also share that I'm Ohio. I'm an Ohio State Buckeye fan. You know, I mentioned my dad. My dad uh, lived there. Um, uh, and and there's a a comment that that Jim Tressel, who was a former head coach of Ohio State, had made after losing a national championship to to uh, I think it was Florida maybe. And it was uh, you know they were in control of the game for the first couple of series, and they ended up getting a roughing the the punter penalty, which gave the ball back to Florida. They went on to score and pretty much, you know, route the, the game. Um, and he made a comment, which was, you know, we always evaluate based on effort and execution, right? And so there's two components there. And, you know, the, if, if there's no effort, well, then there's no point in, in having a, a follow conversation with, you know, whomever you're talking about, you know, uh, um, but, but execution, we can always work on. And so, so that, that really set kind of a, a perspective in my own head <clears throat> about, you know, how I think of individuals. And so, you know, the notion of motivation, ambition, you know, the level of effort that someone brings to the job is, it needs to be inherent in them. It needs to be inborn. It needs to be something that's unquenchable for them, right? I can't create the level of effort that which you perform. Now, that being said, if you've got the right level of that, well, then I can absolutely work with you all day long on making sure you get the execution right. And so from that point of view, um, you know, I love self-motivated people. I love people who are curious and want to solve problems, um, who are risk takers. Um, and again, then when it comes to, well, hey, guess, guess what? You might not be getting it right all the time. You know, we can be highly tolerant uh, and, and work toward creating a plan to improve the execution. 
So how do you get to that in the interview process? And let's say this isn't a direct report. Maybe it's a a key hire of one of your direct reports, but you've got maybe five to 10 minutes. You trust your subordinate to find the right people. But, you know, he or she wants to make sure that, you know, (laughs) they've got your buy off on this important hire. And, you know, you've got a vested interest in obviously, you know, knowing who this person is, as there may be one or two other final candidates. Well, if you had only five minutes, what question would you ask them? So it's probably, um, you know, what activity or conversation have you had with your boss or, you know, a a senior level individual that has been most uncomfortable? And, you know, so what was the topic? How did you present it? How did you then, whatever, reconcile or align with that individual uh, on on a go forward basis? So, you know, helps to kind of give you their, their thoughts on what's important enough to create that kind of uncertainty, but then equally, you know, what's the diplomacy they bring to that conversation. Um, and then, you know, again, in most cases they shouldn't get their way. And so then how do they, how do they process through the notion of not getting their way? Right. Right. It's not so much that they success were successful or failed, uh, in that conversation. It's what they did with it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, there's a great article uh, that Larry Bossidy had written, who is the former CEO of Allied Signal. And, um, and GE before that. Yeah, exactly. You know, he's, he's got a, a stellar career. He's, he writes a lot of things, which I would encourage anyone to read. But, um, but in this article, he wrote about um, how he evaluates his, his people. And uh, one of the comments he makes is that their, you know, their job is to continuously bring him new ideas or recommendations. His job is never to agree with them. But if he doesn't agree with them, he at least owes it to them to articulate the reasons why he doesn't. <laughs> and when he doesn't, their job is to come back the next day with more ideas and recommendations. <laughs> he's big on execution, too. So I know where you get that. Yeah, he's all about making it happen. Well, Rick Carano, this has been terrific. Uh, we always ask one last question and would love to get your insights on this as well. And that, you know, what kind of career and life advice would you give to someone who's got their eyes on the corner office or, or maybe become an entrepreneur and join their own startup at uh, perhaps the point in their career? You know, our audience is, uh, as I said, a lot of middle market as well as Fortune 500 uh, executives who either are looking towards the C-suite or in there and uh, then have got their eyes, you know, uh, focused in on the on the CEO slot. Um, you know, what's uh, what would you pass along to them? Uh, so these these are not my words. These are the words of a gentleman named Jim Lanzone, who is now, I think, president of CBS Interactive. Uh, he was a classmate of mine at Emory Business School. Uh, and anyway, he uh, he had given a speech at where at what point someone had asked that same question. He said, you know, the the key success to any entrepreneur is having a significant other with a full time job. Um, <laughs> like that one. And so, you know, that's uh, you know that is the the magic equation in my opinion is that, you know, when you're out there swinging for the fences as an entrepreneur, you know, you're going to face a lot of adversity. Nothing's going to go as planned. And you know, if you're able to take a little bit of that financial pressure off because somebody else is paying the bills, uh, that is a tremendous amount of, uh, I guess, um, uh, solitude that, that, you, that you'll have. So, Peace of mind, right, exactly. be able to do that. Anything else? Uh, you know, I guess it's all about risk-taking. Uh, you know, we, we've recently did an internal poll here ourselves about management competencies, and, you know, I was rather disappointed to see that one of the, the lower-ranked competencies that people felt was important in leadership was risk-taking. And, 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 and quite frankly, in, and, and maybe that's, again, just because, you know, if you're in the line level um, operations, maybe you're all about uh, mitigating risk, right? So how are you limiting exposure? But certainly where I sit in the CEO seat, it's all about risk and, and you know, where do you, where do you place your bets? And so the notion of being comfortable taking risks, um, the ability to overcome uh, you know, any of the defeats when that risk doesn't, you know, pan out the way you think, uh, you know, that kind of that, what they'll say is a short-term memory. Uh, those are really, really important skills for, for, I think, anyone in leadership, especially a CEO. And, and again, especially if you're working in an industry that is completely undefined, you know, total blue sky, and you're the one trying to, to create the rules. Rick, once again, thank you so much. We appreciate you sharing your story of Into the Corner Office. All right, Brant, thank you all so much. 
Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.go4roi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode. 